Joined by um, Joe Banks. Joe, welcome again. Thank you very much. You've been a regular here, scrutinising the... It's nice to be invited back. Yeah, well, yeah, you, you know, yeah. it's always so much to talk about, the way local government works here mm. in Bristol particularly, and the big pressures on it are mainly, it seems, through the planning system, but there are others too, aren't there? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah I mean, planning's got very controversial. It's also it's getting... This is partly, you know, consequence of the mayoral system in Bristol... That's one of the things the mayoral systems, that's what they're sort of designed to do, is, that, is to, as the mayor often says, get things done. But also planning has become, you know, a, a, a political issue against the Greens in Bristol. It's Labour against the Greens, um, really, to who's going to control the council. Um, and there's, there, 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 there's a lot of con- controversy over... Over pl- planning committees and... Can I just, sorry, to interrupt you, Martin, planning is a biggie, isn't it? I mean, this is one of the major ways in which the people we elect are supposed to be pushing back against unbridled developers, sort of building these massive castles in the sky. In fact, of course, they would build right in the city centre enormous great multi-storey office blocks everywhere, given half a chance, because that's the way they recoup more money. Well, the system in Britain is pro-development. That's one of the things that makes us special in the world because we, we, we allow entrepreneurs to get ahead and do this sort of stuff and there isn't, in fact, a great deal to stop them and there never has been. And it's for private profit. A lot of it is not for the benefit of Bristol itself. This is just somebody saying, well, actually, I think if we build this here, uh, it'll make us a lot of money. That's right. And, of course, uh, in the 1940s, the local authorities had quite significant planning powers. So, you know, they knocked down slum areas, they built council houses in huge estates, and, you know, they, they, there was a, quite a strong, you know, that basically the councils decided what was going to go where what. But that was all got rid of. And we went back to the previous system, which was basically run by those with an eye to making private profit. And that, of course, is exactly what Thatcherism was all about. And, of course, it wasn't actually about people building new businesses. It's about exploiting the margins on real estate. Well, one of the uh, – it's not just giving planning permission for things that the City Council uh, – and I'm not sure which, which you'd like to start with, but I think maybe because we had George Ferguson, the former mayor, on a couple of weeks ago talking about the massive overspend at what they call the Beacon Centre – Oh, is it the Bristol Beacon? Bristol Beacon, yeah. Uh, yeah, so... Which was the Colston Hall. was the Colston Hall, so they decided we're going to have to have a name change because Edward Colston was thrown into the river, and we don't like him anymore. Well, we never did like him, actually, but it's quite good to see him go uh, and to be put into a museum lying on his side with a load of dents in. Uh, but so we've now got this thing called the, uh, the Bristol Beacon, uh, now, uh, just chatting to you before we sat down, I can remember going in there on the grand opening. It would be about, I think, 2008, 2009, uh, where there'd been a massive amount of work done on the Bristol Beacon, mostly uh, Arts Council funded, and as it then was the Colston Hall, with a massive new foyer, several floors, new bars and things. And just looking at the uh, video of this, as it was last weekend, it's this week it was opened uh, officially and it started to do business in there. Uh, business being the operative word, it's quite expensive getting in uh, if you want to get tickets to do this and that. Uh, so it's not really being run for, say, for example, your local amateur dramatic societies and that kind of thing. Uh, but, of course, there will be a good programme on over Christmas. That's why they've opened it now. Uh, can you just uh, t- give us a run-through of the figures? Because initially the council promised that they were going to, uh, set aside £10 million. Pounds. We've got something like yeah. £350 million annual budget, so quite a slice of that uh, for this regeneration. The government were going to make up quite a considerable amount yeah. more. It was going to be... Uh, so it was originally, the budget was £48.8 million. Pounds. Um, that, was, that was established in around 2017. Um, and, yeah, as you say, Bristol City Council were going to put in £10 million. There was funding from – some funding from from the West of England Combined Authority. I think the Arts Council was going to make up the rest. Um, and that was, al- that was already going to be the largest capital redevelopment ever to take place in the, in the southwest arts sector, uh, just to give it some – some context already. Yeah, it's not, it's it not quite fed say ever, is it? Because the, it does go up with inflation. Uh, but in terms of the amount of money actually spent, uh, this is the biggest so far ever. Yeah. Um, so I said, well, well, I said it there as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it, 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 I mean, it was originally at that original price. Um, and what happened, I mean, essentially what, what, what happened um, was that they didn't do any surveying work. This, this is a very old building. You know, there, there was a medieval friary on this site. Um, 
and then there, were, there, there was a sort of Elizabethan hall there. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, you know, any, anyone with a passing knowledge of, of that bit of Bristol, you know, knew that there was that was a very, very old site, old building. Um, but they didn't do any surveying work, and they basically went went in there. Um, you know, just signed off the contracts with the contractor Wilmot Dixon, um, and then discovered that there were all the, all these hidden, you know, nightmares as they as they peeled back the building, and it went into into COVID period, where there there, there were, you know, uh, d- um, delay you know supply issues and labour problems with labour costs and all this, which added to it. But, but not, okay, sorry. So that's the sort of the that's the official uh, line that we're given and we're, we're meant to accept. You know, this was just, you know, events couldn't be helped, and 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 so in twenty twenty one you had a revised budget. It, it jumped to one hundred six point nine million, so more than doubled. And then in January twenty twenty three, the figure had jumped again to one hundred thirty one point nine million. So we've gone from forty eight point eight to 131.9 and the contribution from the council who in this arrangement were liable for any any increase any issue they found all the risk was on the council and just really i mean there have been stories as you said the, the beacon opened this weekend there have been stories in the bristol local media about this uh, you know you've had you've had articles from the from the local democracy reporter in the bristol post you've had the bristol cable write something about it but none of it None, none of it really gives you, you, you again you're, you're basically getting a regurgitation of the official version of events you're not, yeah. you're not getting any, uh, any I think real it's context fair, it's, yeah, yeah, context is so important with these things individuals, um, specific individuals and relationships which, of people yeah, which companies have they worked for in the past yes. who are their best friends who are their chums from old companies yeah. and, uh, uh, Martin, this this sort of thing with um, I mean we're t- hearing there about eight times the amount of money that Bristol City Council was supposed to pay got paid to build this thing. Uh, the same sort of thing, these massive cost overruns uh, has gone on with things like HS2, Hinkley, and actually it's systematic, isn't it, in big defence contracts too. Well, in defence contracts, it's cost plus, and you've only got w- often one per- one company that's going to get the work because they're the only ones who can do it. So that that really that is really where all the money goes. Let's not kid ourselves. We, you know, we argue about this stuff about uh, you know building buildings in Bristol, but the, the defence industry is where where all the real kickbacks get 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 done, and it's the most expensive stuff as well. But anyway, but we're focusing here on this particular thing in Bristol, and. Um, you, you know, I mean, we had George Ferguson in the other week, as you know, who used to be the mayor, and he's a former architect, and he was just saying that was the, that's exactly what he was saying, is that the council basically been totally naive here. They should never have signed this contract mm. where they end up picking up the, the tab for yeah. everything that goes wrong. Well, na- they should is have split it with whoever was, was doing yeah. the contract, but is they it, didn't do it. Is it naive, or is it people who are mates who are working at, well, together. I would, what I'd suggest is um, you, you're dealing with a bit of psychology here maybe in that if you put a mayor in charge of everything and he's actually not all that well versed with things like these sort of contracts for example as George Ferguson yeah, was Ferguson would understand now you've, got a, you've yeah. got a mayor and they're saying well can you sign this please yeah and sign on the dotted yes. line he's not actually able to say well hang on a minute what if this bit goes wrong uh, is there penalty clauses for the contractors? Yeah. Because he's not do- the mayor isn't doing. He's 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 given this to a ch- guy called Colin Moulton, who was the executive director of Growth and Regeneration. Yeah, um, he was overseeing the contract in 2018, and this is where I think you've got to look back to, to, to understand this. Is look back to what was going on in Bristol Bristol Council mm-hmm. in 2017 and 2018. Um, so Colin Moulton had come in essentially into the council in October 2017 from um, Homes England, or as it was then, the, the Homes and Communities Agency, which was basically the, the um, and sort of quite sort of quango, uh, spending government money, but not, not departmental, not a, not a department of government, um, whose job it is to basically build affordable housing and be a be a developer be a be a property developer but, but for the government to get con get projects off the ground he had so he'd come in uh, in 2017 
essentially to get the arena deal sorted, um, which was this switch that, that was then going on between uh, Fer- the, 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 the city centre arena that Ferguson had organised, had set up, which was going to be by, t- by Temple Meads. You then, the thing that really shifted that was in 2017 when Bristol City Council sold um, a load of, the, 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 a big chunk of that area, not, not the arena area, but the area next to it, to um, Bristol University to build a new campus. And if you just run through the, 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 the dates of that, so that was in March um, 2017. The following month, um, in April 2017, uh, you had the Malaysian developer YTL contacting this chap called uh, Baramak uh, Rory, who was a uh, Bristol City Council officer, um, director of PLACE, um, suggesting that there could be an alternative, uh, that they, they could potentially, they would be interested in having discussions about building an arena at the north of the city in Filton. They owned um, uh, these aircraft hangars there. Um, the next month, this, this, this the guy leaves Bristol City Council to go and work for YTL. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, um, and then, just to, just to pull a f- few strands together, so he leaves in May 2017, joins YTL... Then the following month, you have the Grenfell disaster. That's June the 14th, 2017. Um, and this, this, this ties into another big story in Bristol that's happened in the last few weeks, which, is, which has been this evacuation uh, of 400 council tenants from this 1950s tower block um, Barton House. And so, again, you've got to look... I think you've got to look back to if you if you're asking yourself why why in 2023 were 400 people um, suddenly evacuated from their their homes on, on a dark November night with no warning um, six years after Grenfell you've got to look back at this period what was going on uh, in uh, Bristol City Council in 2017 um, this was this was about a month ago it was uh, really controversial at the time. <laughs> Uh, and the amazing thing about it is it was an evacuation. It wasn't an eviction. There wasn't any, you know, proper legal process by which people who lived there were actually served and could say, well, actually, no, I, I, I don't agree with this. Or there was no court. You know, they were not given any opportunity in court. Um, and just to um, bring up, bring us up to date on what's happening there, this week, Barton House tenants have been demanding that council bosses pause their rent. This is something that George Ferguson said it was absolutely extraordinary that they're still being yeah, charged rent, crazy. even though they've been uh, evicted. Uh, survey results are expected to show next week uh, that uh, whether or not the tower block is safe to return to. Uh, so this is a process which could have taken place. What you're suggesting is back in 2017. In fact, it should, yes, have, so it should have taken so place. So what happened after Grenfell? You remember the, you know, the shock of that event, the, the horror. You know, the whole country felt... And, and 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 this sudden this, i mean this 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 you know uh, intense in, intense move to f- intense focus on social t- town blocks all over the country particularly on the cladding because obviously the cladding was the issue with the fire going up the building but all all aspects and what what's been uncovered is that a letter was sent from uh, someone called Tamara Finkelstein, the Director General for the Building Safety Programme from the Department for Communities and Local Government, on September the 5th, 2017, she writes to all local authority chief, chief executives about these large panel system buildings, which, which Barton House is, that's the construction, it was built in 1958. Um, there had been... There, uh, in 2017, they'd done investigations of LPS blocks in Southwark, and this letter sent to, you know, sent to every um, council in the country, said it is important with all large panel systems buildings that their structural history is known, and that their condition and continued structural integrity are understood and monitored. This should include desktop studies where necessary to establish what strengthening work has been undertaken, and to, ass- crucially, to assess the original design of the building. 
This is the issue that has led to the sudden eviction of people the other week because the council said we've had this they've done a survey here in 2023 that's come back and said uh, this the, the building doesn't match the original pla the plans that we have of the of well this. well there's two major um, problems here one is that they didn't act on the original letter yes they didn't Se act on the secondly letter. uh it's almost like it's an arbitrary time for them to have evacuated it uh there's quite a lot of conspiracy theories if i can call them that mm. and actually someone you know needs an explanation of what's happening uh the what the council are telling the residents doesn't make it m much sense at all to most of them the residents themselves have said that they want a timeline from the council or maybe they should just listen to this show <laughs> to yeah, get a well, bit of a timeline well, 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 i put happening. in a freedom of information request about this letter to the council i'm still waiting to hear back from them they're still within their statutory Lim so the, time limit well, the that. point is that but, people but we, are saying we, 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 there could be other reasons for that meeting being cancelled rather than this is the the, the November 4 council meeting uh, rather than that th th this could possibly have been, if you're well, a cynical person, I don't an excuse. So. Well, some people are saying what yeah. they're saying is that there was some uh, there was an item on the agenda at the last four council meeting which would have been extremely embarrassing mm -hmm. for the mayor Marvin Rees to have to answer, and that was to do with. Uh, the wrong legal advice over complaints that have been going on in the city council mm. so there were several items which are controversial the mayor was out of the country uh, for the november full council he's always here for the cabinets but not for the full council meetings he seems to sort of schedule his trips away yeah, to he's coincide he's in Dubai at the moment. yeah that's right so this um, next meeting he won't be here i think actually this um, latest full council meeting he's not he's not but there. Th those questions will be asked at this full council meeting coming up next week um so i do think that you know i I do think that is a, a step too far to think there's a conspiracy there because I, you know, I don't think they would have just turned out 400 people uh, on, you know, at five five o'clock. No or maybe warning. it's just that uh, the decision making process that. is completely failing, uh, and they're panicking. Uh, so, so anyway, uh, what what about um, the yeah? So get, yeah, let's get yeah. back to Barton House. Yes. Yeah, so you had that letter. You had that letter coming in September, and and, and uh, this wasn't clearly wasn't acted on. That same day that that was sent. September the 5th, 2017, the Chief of Executive of Bristol City Council, Anna Klonowski, I'm not sure that's the right pronunciation, but sh she resigned. Um, and she'd been, she'd been in the role less than seven months, um, but she left the job literally that same day, saying that she wanted to focus on her role as a carer for her parents. Um, now, I, I don't think the two things are, are linked, but, but you then you clearly had this period where there was... You know, no. Not only was she gone, and there wasn't. She wasn't replaced for another um, seven months until Mike Jackson became chief executive. You also, you can you can see the, um, you can see council documents of their, their list of senior uh, management from the period. Um, twelve of the twenty-five senior officers in the council. Twelve of those positions were vacant. Um, so it's a period where th there's, a, there's a certain clearly an element of sort of chaos in the council and, and lack of leadership. St step in the following month, October. This guy Colin Moulton comes from Homes England. He takes up the position of um, executive director of growth and regeneration. He's um, on, a, on a vast salary on 256 grand a year, incidentally. Um, he'd also been, he, he's one of these people who's come from the Southwest Regional Development Agency as well before that, like the current chief executive, Stephen Peacock, um, the, the merchant venturers, um, John Savage and Colin Skellett, um, who owns Wessex Water and runs UK YTL, relevant, um, so he's brought in Essentially, at this point, that Bristol University have bought this, bought the land, want to build a campus, and there's this move now that we don't want to have an arena in the city centre. 2017, um, Marvin Rees has his flights and his accommodation paid for by YTL to go to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia and meets YTL. He also, while he's there, meets the Malaysian uh, development firm EcoWorld. Now, EcoWorld 
the previous month, in November, had announced a joint venture with Wilmot Dixon, the contractor of the Bristol Beacon. Um, this was um, a 70... Eco World had taken a 70% stake in Wilmot Dixon's uh, residential arm because Wilmot Dixon are a developer as well um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a builder, as a, as a contractor. Um, and at this point, stepping into the story, we have Sir Edward Lister, who was <laughs> Boris Johnson's right-hand man when he was London mayor. Previous to that, he'd been the long-time um, chief uh, council leader of Wandsworth Council, uh, famously the, uh, the the sort of trailblazer uh, for local authorities who uh, went into privatisa privatisation and outsourcing um, in these in the I mean even even I mean, the, they started doing it even before Thatcher got going. They started doing this in the late seventies. Uh, Martin, can you say something about this? Because this Lister guy, I mean, this was controversial. Even Conservative councils uh, at the time were saying you can't um, contract out to a private company. Things like the, uh, the uh, local bin collections and things like that. So this guy was a what you would call as a, as as Joe has just described, a, a trailblazer in getting things privatised when it was way, way before it was in fashion in the 1980s. Yeah, well, I was living in South... I was living in Fulham at the time, and that was just across the river from Wandsworth. So we were very well aware of what was going on there. And, of course, all of these things have to be, you know, bl uh, trailblazed by somebody. Which then, And then, of course, when they get away with it, everybody else is off. I mean, I mean, it's just normal now to imagine that everything's going to be contracted out. It wasn't in those days because there was a culture of certain things yeah. have to be run by the council because that's the appropriate body to well, run. Because it. then, if they go bankrupt, uh, the council will deal with it rather than uh, suddenly all the all well, the. They don't go bin bankrupt because they're part of the council. They can't go bankrupt. Well, once they've been privatised, they once they've been privatised, they can go bankrupt. Yes, and, and they, they could also bankrupt. fail to deliver. And people, I mean, one of the things we used to, we used to knock on doors around Bristol, you know, was, uh, was knocking on doors for the Labour Party, and people would complain about the waste collection. And the local councillors have to explain to people, well, we don't directly do that anymore. Mm. The, the, we, 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 in the old days, we could have gone straight to the waste collection people and said, you know, what's happening here in, in on, on this? But it's, it's, there's a whole set of people you have to go to. Yeah. My dad used to be a head teacher. The dinner staff used to be re accountable to him. But once it's privatised out, the cleaning, then people come in and say the cleaning hasn't been done. He, he's got no, he, there's nothing he can do about it. Mm. It's a contract that's been made above his head. And this, of course, this culture of subcontracting has just become the norm. Well, it's, and, it's, of course, it's, it's now begun to dawn on people that it's actually stupid. It's also it was stupid. parasitic, as we've seen, with the um, what's been going on at Bristol Beacon, with Bristol Energy, these various <laughs> things where, you know, the council is saying, oh, what do you mean? We have to cough up another £50 million. Pounds. Oh, no, where are we going to get that from? Yeah, well, it's the whole concept of the third sector. I used to be a social economy development worker for the council briefly, and the whole idea of the third sector was that it's not run by the government or by the local authority, and it's not private, it's something else. And, of course, what that really boiled down to, it was quite interesting. We had a Japanese delegation from Kobe in Japan coming to see what we were doing, and they asked some very pertinent questions, like, well, um, you know, you, you've given this building in South, Southville, the, the, what used to be a school has become Southville Community Centre, and they said it's on a, a nine... A, 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 uh, it's on a what, what is it a 999 year lease i mean what's that about because of course it's illegal to just give it to them because it's public property you can't just hand it over to a third sector organization so what they've done is they've got around this by giving out these massive long leases which these japanese civil servants picked up immediately what's this about and of course there is no legal basis for the third sector this is what the legal people in the council mm. were telling us. Look, you can't use public funds or public... Bo you've got to sell it at what it's well, worth. Well, this is why I come you back to... You can't just hand it over uh, to a... Th and I, they, were t they were trying to task me to come up with a cost-benefit analysis which would show that this third sector organisation, Southfield Community Centre, whatever it was, uh, would be of more benefit to Bristol than if the council carried on running it. And I had to tell them I can't come up with that because it's just, you know, he's just making stuff it's up. It's fiction. And it's illegal. In any case, I spoke, spoke to the legal people in the council and they said, well, they can't do that, it's illegal. Well, well, There's no point uh, I mean, there is, there is a sub a text and a sub agenda to all of this, and that is that 
the more you outsource stuff, the less you have to be responsible for it, and the more you can just hold up your hands uh, when everything collapses. And um, actually what we've been seeing over the last few months is several uh, urban uh, city councils going bankrupt and simply not being able to afford to run these services at all. In fact, there's a whole bunch of statutory services that they have to run. So that's why they've been closing things like um, public toilets because this is not a statutory thing that they have to do so they've been paring everything down to only the things that they are forced to do by law and even those they're getting away with not doing like special educational needs kids uh, they're not educating them properly even though they're supposed to by law but anyway let's get back to the uh, this yeah, story Sir uh, edward lister yeah Sir Sir edward, edward lister, lister. Yeah. so he's, he's he's done his his, his work in wandsworth um and then he he joins boris johnson in 2011 um, and become is his is is his steadying. He's known as Steady Eddie. He's his steadying influence. You know, you've got the chaos of Boris Johnson. He's his the guy who's sorting out the deals. You know, doing the work in the background. Um, and he is his um, chief of staff and deputy mayor for planning in London, 2011 to 2016. And he's. Um, uh, one of the controversies of his time there, he, you know, he's, he's a man with all kinds of conflicts of interest. Um, one of the things he does there, he approves the development of Barking Wharf, um, despite City Hall officers raising concerns that it included no affordable housing, which was in breach of the London guidelines. Payments were made by the developer uh, in lieu of affordable housing. Um, and this was Wilmot Dixon, again um it was owned owned by Wilmot dixon and then it was bought by this malaysian company eco world in 2017 now lister's relationship with eco world when he steps when johnson stops being mayor in 2016 uh lister becomes the chairman of Ho of the, the the homes and communities agency um, which is now homes england um, but two weeks later he takes up a directorship uh, with EcoWorld, and 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 the Times actually reported in 2020 that between 2016 and 2019, Lister took almost 500,000 pounds in consultancy fees um, from EcoWorld. So they were. Let's just make it clear: they were consultancy fees, not bribes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's very clear. I yeah. think that's what he'd say. Um, so can we just bring this up a bit more up to date with Lister in Bristol? Yeah, well, the, so and then, so you've got you've got you've got Malt, Malton there. Malton is, was obviously at, at Homes England uh, with Lister. He invites uh, Marvin Rees to a dinner. Um, this, the, the invitation goes out late January 2018, um, and they they attend this dinner at the Mercure Brigstow uh, on February the 21st. Um, and at this point, the the arena, the arena scheme is is pretty well developed, um, and Marvin Rees wants he both wants Homes England's involvement in the wider Temple Quarter project, and he wants Edward Lister's personal backing for for this arena switch. Um, so they they have this dinner on February the twenty first. Interestingly, I'm not saying this is directly connected but again it's, it ties into this issue of relationships around this the very day after that dinner um wilmot dixon announced that they're the chosen contractor for the colston hall refurbishment um and contract negoti negotiations are ongoing with colin moulton overseeing that for bristol city council um and if if you look if you look through you can see, you can see through freedom of information requests you can see the the correspondence between Lister's assistant and and Reese's assistant throughout for, throughout 2018. It's quite funny actually because they're, Reese is desperately trying to get a breakfast or a lunch or a dinner with Lister, um, and they can they can never find a date. But but eventually they they do have a breakfast meeting. Um, Oh, well, and, and after that dinner, you can you can see the exchanges um, where where Lister is saying he you know he, he'll he'll do anything he can to support 
risk. I'd just like to contrast um, this with the whole situation with the Coomba project, with them um, asking uh, to meet Marvin Rees. Marvin Rees is far too busy yeah. because he's typing emails trying to meet these yeah top Tories yeah. and then they don't want to meet him but he's you know there's a, there's a bit of an interesting contrast there well uh, I mean I, the overall picture I mean, you, this is this can get quite complicated and he is a, he's a Tory this is the clear, clear key thing this guy is a top private pro privatization Tory strategist yeah. I mean re what Reese would probably say was you know I, I, I've got to deal with the world as I find it and I'm trying to get the best thing for Bristol um, but he I mean he yeah he, he totally um, uh, but I think you can you can see in the in, in in the move of the arena, and in in the way that you know the establishment of Bristol can get their classical music hall for whatever whatever it costs. Um, but the, the 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 democratic idea of having an arena for everyone, a twelve thousand um, venue in the centre of the city, rather than sh you know where, where where people in South Bristol, people in North Bristol can come together, come to it, rather than having this thing stuck out, you know, built by this M M Malaysian property developer right on the northern fringe. Um, it's not even in Bristol, is it? It's South Gloucester. It's right on the border. Right, just Gloucester. on the edge. Yeah. But, but, but to me, it, it, it shows you who's, who's, running the, who's running the show, really. You know, who's running Who? Bristol. Who is running Bristol? Well, it's... Uh, it's well, you've got, the, you've got vested property interests. You've got this very... Uh, well run you know tightly connected network of um, of people connected to the merchant venturers who, who 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 are connected to the 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 various quangos um, you know and you can keep uh, and we have we haven't e we haven't even got into and, the, and 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 you have a a real lack of scrutiny both from, you know, within the council, you're supposed to have opposition councillors who are scrutinising all this stuff, and you're supposed to have a local media who are, in, you know, investigating it and bring it to light. And I, and I think Bristol lacks, is, 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 is lacking, an, you know, an effective ability to scrutinise, you know, in both areas. Well, I think, I mean, the media have done a reasonable job, to, considering the amount of information that's out there. Like you say, you have to do these freedom of information requests. So, for example, I mean... Yeah, uh, Martin, I put it to you that much of this is a bunch of people who are actually really in their heart of hearts interested in private businesses and their careers. They don't really care about, you know, whatever it is, 350,000 Bristolians that vote for them. Uh, and actually, it has ended up rather convenient for the, um, uh, for the privatisers. They're bleeding the city dry. Well, I think that's certainly the case that people are... Uh, you know, this revolving door between the quangos and the private mm. sector is extremely dubious, is it not? Um, and uh, I think that what, what you just said about Marvin, he, what he would say is he's just dealing with the world as it is rather than as anyone would like it to be. But that has becomes an excuse for just basically letting these people do whatever they want mm. and actually, of course, getting your benefit from it because you then present yourself as somebody who gets stuff done yeah. And you can then present yourself. I suppose as in, a, this, in a recession, this, this in a recession right. or a slump, uh, one of the few places where there are big lumps of cash that um, unscrupulous developers or anybody can get their hands on is in big in local government. If you can well, find somebody, local government somebody, has always been a place. Yeah. I mean, local government because it makes the planning decisions. The developers, the property developers, the people who spend money on property. They've, they've got a, you know, it's like, it's like criminal gangs want to corrupt poli the police, you know. That's a, it's an essential part of what you've got to do. Well, so we've been looking at three main things. We've been looking at the uh, Bristol Beacon, which is uh, in the city centre. Uh, it's the new uh, concert hall that's just been revamped. I don't really think it needed to be revamped, but it was for... Uh, 130 odd million pounds uh we've also been looking at barton house and uh and finally the arena and the move of the arena all these are big projects which hasn't been hasn't even started building not even, no one's even the arena they, is just it's just talk they, they, they put in you know because what they did ytl is they put in a load of you know huge luxury development residential development 2500 uh flats um and 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 but they needed to put in all the, you know, to, if they were going to do an arena, they had to get all the um, the transport, the infrastructure in, which is now now just feeding their their property development. 
There's no, they haven't that started. Is, that is paid for by the council yes. or the infrastructure. That's, that's I mean, public money. Yeah. Also, the new, new train station. The decision to uh, to have the university take over the Temple Mead site rather than the mm. arena, which seems to me is all predicated around the student grants and student loans for, it's not grants is it? it's loans there's loads of money coming into the pockets well, of students. students plus as you say loads of foreign students who are paying what, even higher 20, fees 20, at least 25 percent of bristol university students that's right students. so there is they know that there's a load of cash coming in mm. with regards to university students and, and, this, not, uh, and this new campus is a business it's an in, what they call it an enterprise campus you know it's this this is not people learning um you know ancient greek or and, whatever and, um, um, but but it's it, and, I, and and the, and the big ai supercomputer i think that's going to be on that oh on whoopee that, yeah uh, okay campus. anyway look so the council would have spent uh, it's estimated a uh, either four or five figure sum so somewhere between a thousand and maybe twenty thousand uh, on doing this survey at barton house that they should have done back in 2017 Mm. Um, it'd be interesting to talk to that chief executive that left the same day yeah. about whether that yeah. was discussed and whether she but was we, told yeah, no, we we're, to we're not going to do it. What would they did with this letter? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, and, it just got lost somewhere, got put in a waste paper bin or deleted I mean, off the email. You know, after Grenfell, after seeing what happened. Yeah, it's just like, oh, well, we shouldn't. can't be bothered to do this. But they they, they couldn't be bothered. Uh, but well, they, well, they, 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 were, they were thinking about other things. This is what I'm saying. They would... They were really focused. They would have had to spend a bit oh. of money, but now, um, even oh. if next week everyone can go back to Barton House, that will still have cost Bristol £3.5 million. So rather than spending ten grand back in 2017, Martin, we're now looking at, uh, well, however many times, three and a half million is what? Is it another hundred, hundred times the, well, they, the they, cost? They won't, I don't think they'll go back in. I, think, I don't think anyone's going to go and live in that. No? No, I think it's... I think so dead. what are they going to do, redevelop it? They'll knock it down. Rebuild um, it then. Rebuild and it. We'll nice get it. Place we'll <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, this is what happened in London quite a lot. Uh, George Ferguson, the former mayor, was quite cynical about whether he thought that would ever happen. So anyway, what, do you want to just sum up, um, please, Joe? Uh, uh, what this tells us, this, this sorry tale about the sort of cliquey nature and who some of these key figures are uh, of the way that the city council is now being run. Well, I mean, w w we're due a big change. Uh, Marvin Rees goes in May next year. Um, and I hope I hope there will I hope there will be an adjustment and there will there, you know, what happened you know Bristol had a, had this reputation where you couldn't get things done where you couldn't get th things through planning, so they they've really uh, pounced on on Reese and seen it and seen in him someone who did what they wanted them them to do. Yeah, he, he just um, wanted cranes on the horizon. And yeah, that, to, that was and, good. And, 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 and because that shows doing. energy and ambition and, you know, and, you know, there are lots of things, especially in a time of austerity, you know, where so a mayor is, is restricted in a huge amount of what they can do. Um, and so, you know, development be, be, and regeneration become this big thing that you can you can show you're doing stuff. Um, but, with, but, yeah, it's, but this whole development around um you know, where the arena was going to be, I actually haven't said what what is happening there now. Um, I mean, this was another shocking thing: was that what in order in order to get the arena moved to the, the Filton on the, on the northern fringe of Bristol, they had to beat what's called a sequential test, where you, where if you have a city centre site for some big piece of infrastructure, that's always got to take priority because you don't want you're trying to limit people travelling. I mean, and you know, obviously this was right next to Temple Me Station, the biggest, the busiest. Uh, you know, transport nut sort of hub in the southwest. Um, but in order to do that, they had they had to stitch up this deal with legal and general, the asset manager, to work out. This, and this, this was the other thing that Colin Moulton was doing at the time. You know, they weren't thinking about the the social housing stock. They were they, they were desperate to stitch up this deal so they could they could get work out what they were going to do with the arena site. Um, so they gave legal and general this fantastic deal where they said uh, Bristol City Council will spend £32 million just preparing the site for you and then we'll guarantee rents for 40 years on one of the um, office blocks you want to build there. So, so that's the deal that's been done. And now uh, legal and general are going to build a conference centre, hotel, offices and some flats. Are council tax payers paying there? Yes. Yeah, and guaranteeing rents in their office block. It's, you know... It's crazy, but they were they were desperate to get the sort. They couldn't they couldn't get the arena things done in Filton unless they had 
that that deal sorted. sounds like the sort of deal that um, Gordon Brown did back in 2008, Martin, to uh, bail out the economy. The bank's saying, look, it's all going to go crazy unless you sign this piece of paper, Gordy. Well, I think it's more like the uh, private finance initiative, which they did that because it doesn't, if, you, if you've got, if you borrow the money from the city, it doesn't go on to public expenditure. It just, it, 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 it becomes, you know, it's not, it's not counted as public expenditure. But of course, it's much cheaper to do it yourself than borrowing the money. And this is typical of, the, of what's been going on, on every level. And of course, I think what George Ferguson, obviously, um, he, he pretty much critical of all of this stuff. I mean, he, d- mm. he just didn't approve of any of it because his approach was very much uh, rather the opposite. I mean, I think it's also fair to say there's been a complete breakdown in relationships as well within the City Council under our marvellous Marvin the Mayor. And uh, I see this week Labour is going to, the Labour Party is going to boycott Bristol planning meetings uh, in what they're calling a race and religious abuse row. So uh, planning committee chair... Uh, that's Annie Stafford Townsend is taking legal advice on defamation after Bristol's Labour Group's decision not to a- attend meetings until further notice. So, I mean, why? why what's what's what, why are they saying this? Well, this was around. So, this was this was a very controversial um, application where where the the, the council w- want to expand um, a cemetery, South Bristol Cemetery, yeah. on land that they had previously. Uh, rented to um, Yew Tree Farm, which is the last working farm in Bristol. Right. Um, and it got very, you know, a lot of passionate defenders of the, this last farm, which is being nibbled away at. There's also a developer who yeah. wants some of the land. Um, and it, at the end of the meeting, it got it got kind of very heated. Um, and there was a, there, there was there was a, a Muslim lady there who, who, who had taken umbrage at the fact that the, a Muslim Labour councillor had brought up the issue of. Um, of, 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 of burials for, uh, for for Muslim people, and then and then and then, then the, the, the Labour councillor had got upset that she'd brought that in, and there was a bit of a hoo ha over that. But you know, this is this is just where planning has become a bit of a football, um, and I think it's 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 a way to hit, hit the greens and. You know. So, it, so can, I, can I just clarify this? I, I wouldn't have known about this unless I'd be on the show. Mm. So the Labour Party are boycotting the planning. Well, you would. It's been in the local press. Yes, yeah, so, well, I haven't followed it. That's, I'm sorry, Tony. Which is, but, but that's, I mean, but, I'm, but, I'm following Biaza in Ukraine. You know, those meetings, that those made meetings will still be um, quarried. Is, 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 that's what it yeah. says, not quarried. So, so they can still go <coughs> ahead, e- even if Labour councillors aren't there. So, yeah. so I don't, I don't really understand. I mean, they're, they're sort of grandstanding, but I'd... Sure Let's just read no, out what uh, was said, it. allegedly, anyway, in the Bristol Post article. Uh, Councillor Stafford Townsend, that was who was chairing the meeting, came down from the chair's seat to accompany the members of the public out of the council chamber, telling them to take it outside, which does he sound like the right, best way to put it. Uh, well, see you outside, <laughs> see you mate. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and Ms Dumont continued, she was one of the... Um, um, uh, people who were campaigning for Yew Tree Farm not to be um, given up to the cemetery, this section of Yew Tree Farm. Where are the people to represent us, she said. Not not sitting there saying that. I'm a Muslim. I'm not expecting my relative to die now and then just keep that area for them, for them to use my religion to prove something. That is the ruin of dot, dot, dot. And that's when um, uh, the... Uh, he, he was interrupted by Councillor Farah Hussain, uh, Labour for Central in Bristol, uh, whom the comments were directed, interrupted. She said, no, I'm not accepting that. And the argument continued as that recording ended. So there was an argument of some sort uh, after that uh, about this. And, and uh, the fact that, that um, uh, I can't quite see how this is, is worth uh, no, something they, they, that they is... You know, they're, yeah. they're just trying to make. They're saying that this to, was racist because the word Muslim to, was used. It's a way to attack the um, the green chair of the committee, really, because you know the, the other the other planning committee is chaired by the Conservative Richard Eddy, who's got into his own big controversy around the Broadwalk. Um, but anyway, so we, we're looking at lots of kind of meltdowns here, and do chip in if you've got any other bits and pieces to add. But uh, we've got some good news. 
<laughs> I'll give you that in a minute. First, the bad news. <laughs> the more bad news. Bristol Watershed Cinema Chief has slammed the loss of public funding and claims the city's underinvests in culture. Well, of course, when uh, there's no money around, uh, this is the first thing to go. You know, all the nice things in life, uh, like cinemas, yeah. plays, uh, bad, pubs, bad and timing all. with the beacon. Um, yeah, and the blow comes in the same week that two other cinemas in Bristol are closing down. Uh, a cinema chief has slammed the loss of public funding uh, as she claimed Bristol underinvests in the city's culture. Uh, next April, the watershed and the old Vic Theatre and Exchange music venue will lose thousands of subsidies that they have been getting for many years from Bristol City Council. Uh, Claire Reddington, chief executive of the watershed, said Bristol doesn't have a clear cultural strategy. Uh, and various people around the city have pointed out... Um, this is amazing, really, Joe, that the body that uh, decides on these, this funding is now anonymous. That was mind-blowing. I couldn't I mean, I, I, I'm continually shocked. You know, I always think I can't get any more You would think, well, hang on, but there must be a committee of councillors that goes through this and looks at the benefits of each mm. one that, that members of the public can go and chat with and lobby for or whatever, and even uh, directors of these various places can say, well, we think, you know, it's worth the 10 grand or 20 grand, whatever we get from you, uh, for this reason. Uh, and, uh, no, it's an anonymous group of people that this is the way things are this is called the one city plan i believe yes so, yes yeah, so, i mean this is t entirely typical designed of, to divide and rule of of of, <laughs> of the mayoral you know system the system that, that reese has brought in but you don't you don't need democratic scrutiny you don't need accountability um you're just going to get voted and you can you can basically do what you like and, and you're you're, you're going to pick the right people to do the job and you don't need to tell the public who they are yeah, well, as a, mm. uh, another journalist around the, around the city who's been doing a lot of look, digging into this, so I'll put a link up to that on our show page at thisweek.org.uk. But we must finish with the good news. Anyone like to guess what the good news is? I can't imagine. Three million pounds Bristol Council tax benefit cuts have been scrapped in the major U-turn where we were discussing this with Acorn and with George Ferguson and with Jeff Gollop over the last few weeks that uh, the council was looking to spend six million pounds on trying to get three million pounds from some of the poorest people in the city where they actually reckon they might only get half a million but spending, spending six million quid to get around about half a million back from the poorest in the city this this was a bit of a no-brainer so they've done a u-turn uh, on this one that uh, mayor marvin reese's cabinet will abandon the idea after a huge campaign from acorn uh plans to cut three million pounds in council tax benefits have been scrapped uh, deputy mayor councillor craig cheney we've been seeing quite a lot of craig cheney haven't we because marvin's never around. jetting around the world of course on his uh, electric powered uh, private <laughs> plane probably uh he's made the surprise announcement on mayor Marvin reese's blog in fact marvin is not even in town to write his blog <laughs> so it's, uh, it's you can just imagine a computer sitting there for days gathering dust <laughs> as as the mayor is out around the world and craig's thinking well, we ought to put something on here uh but anyway he says the decision meant the authority would have to find savings from elsewhere to balance the books well I mean, if you sat and looked at the amount of overspend that this council's been uh, under, particularly under Mayor Marvin Rees, has been doing, I mean, they wouldn't have this problem with balancing the books. But I wonder, finally, from both of you, whether you think, Martin, you first, whether the council is going to be able to balance the books. This was a question we put to uh, Jeff Gollop, and he certainly wasn't sure whether Bristol may be heading towards bankruptcy. No, uh, what he said was... Um, they're not going to balance the books except on paper. They've got, in theory, you see... But that's not good enough, is it? Well, if no, your bank account's empty and you can't pay your no, staff... No, the point is you've got... There are legal requirements on councils to balance the books. You see, national governments don't have such a requirement, but local authorities do. So they can't just, you know, borrow money and, and try and get, get by. If there, there are rules that prevent them from doing that, although, of course, there are ways round it. Uh, you know, you, you, you basically make sure the expenditures... Well, they can on capital... Bit, yeah. You know, they, they, that's what they're going to do with the beacon, is just borrow yeah. loads of money. Yeah. Because um, it's a capital investment. Yes, that's but, right. but so, they have a revenue budget with yeah. the discovery That's right. I mean, I, mean, obviously, I mean, obviously, the person um, who knows more about this is George yeah, Ferguson, who used to, used to run the council. So he knows more about it than I do. As the interest the, rates go up, what are they going to do? Well, yeah. that's, a, that's a problem not just for councils. All sorts of businesses are going to go down the drain as we go. We're going to have a depression in the whole of Western Europe and, and, and Britain. Yeah, but there because is they, I mean, up the Nord Stream Two pipeline. There is another way of doing things. And uh, last Saturday, I was up in Birmingham at the Congress of something called the Workers' Party. I'm George Galloway. I'm the leader of the Workers' Party, and this is our annual Congress in Birmingham. 
but much of the conversation has been about London because I declared uh, this day that I will be running for Mayor of London. I've got the signatories. You need 10 signatories from 33 boroughs, so 330 signatories, and I've got them double just in case there are any slip-ups. So I'm poised now to enter the race, and I'm going to give Sadiq Khan a run for his money because...